Have you ever wished you had a time machine? Like just to be able to parachute into somewhere deep in the past and ride on horseback through Victorian London or hang out with a glass of wine in ancient Rome. And most of all, wherever you are, what about the food? Imagine the smells and tastes of dishes long forgotten, old methods and old recipes that once upon a time must have tasted just like home. Well, here in Bangkok, if we could go back in time to the end of the 19th century, what we'd probably find would look like this. Nanglung Market, the oldest and best preserved indoor food market in Thailand. Open for more than 120 years, and while the country has changed in almost every way, in here, the great-grandchildren of the first vendor still sell their meals to the great-grandchildren of the first customers. And today, they're also selling to me, because I'm here to eat everything. Our mission today is simple, to find the oldest foods in the oldest forms sold here in Bangkok, and to understand what life here was like in the old days, even if we don't have a time machine. Around 7 o'clock every morning, this small stand along the outer ring of Nanglung Market begins to set up for the breakfast rush. The dish is called patongo, or Thai-style donuts. Though if you've been to China before, you'll know this as yotiao. In Thailand, it's been sold since the second half of the 1800s, brought by Chinese immigrants who settled here around this neighborhood. At Nanglung Market, the sound of the dough frying in the wok is like an alarm bell the signal that starts the morning here, as it has for 123 years. For the first customers of the day, patongo or other light snacks are more than enough, as they come here to buy groceries. Nanglung is still technically a wet market, although only a handful of folks from the neighborhood actually shop here, and by 9.30 in the morning, the few remaining produce and meat sellers are already wrapping up. And by 10, there's barely even a hint that there are groceries sold here at all, as the air fills with smells of woks and grills and big pots of soup. I've talked before on this channel about those moments in history, the culinary big bangs when dishes spread and evolved rapidly all around the world. Well, one of those triggers was the growth of permanent markets like this one. And what really boomed and developed around these brand new markets was snacks. At the time this market opened, people still ate meals typically at home. They'd come here to buy groceries. But if you were already here to buy vegetables and rice, well, why not also pick up something special for the kids or grandparents at home? A lot of the food still sold here today fits in that category snacks or treats sold for a few pennies and packaged for takeaway. Okay, there's a secret hidden inside every Asian wet market. If you want to know what the real stuff is, the food with the oldest history, the most authentic dishes to a specific area, you have to stop thinking like a customer. Foods sold anywhere changes and evolves based on what's popular. I mean, vendors gotta make a living. But the vendors need to eat, too, and in every single market, usually in some back corner, even in places that are only known for produce or fresh seafood, you'll always find a stall selling cheap and filling meals intended for the market workers. Here, that means soup noodles. You know, again, Thailand was a, not Thailand, I mean, the world was a, was an eat-at-home culture, right? Like, there wasn't that much prepared food that would have been available when this market first opened at the end of the, uh, the, the 1800s. And then, um, but what you would find was stuff like this. You'd find soups, you know, and, and stews and things that would sit in a big pot and they'd sell it until it was sold out. And the idea of, like, cooking something to order was really uncommon until, you know, early 20th century. Uh, at least in restaurants. I mean, that was stuff you would eat at home. You'd come to this market originally for ingredients. 
but if you can think of what the first things that would have been sold here as prepared dishes were, I mean, it's probably this. I mean, this is like trip back in time. I've had food just like this in Chaozhou, which is where these, uh, the first wave of immigrants here would have come from. Uh, this was a Chaozhou neighborhood. Uh, as I drop my food mm. in the spring rolls, which have egg, <laughs> crab stick, that's probably more of a newer addition. And is this char shao? Like, oh, Chinese sausage. By the way, as a quick side note, one of the coolest things I ever saw on Bourdain was a place in Hong Kong making egg noodles like this. The old way, back-breaking labor almost entirely by now replaced by automation, but the secret to making these noodles perfectly. Almost nobody left on earth still does it this way. I mean, literally less than a dozen people, but this shop does. And that's one of the things about these old corners of old cities. It's not just the foods that are hard to find, it's the techniques. But I mean, how do you even know what you're eating? I mean, I knew about these egg noodles because it's literally painted on the wall, but the rest of the market, what was this stuff and where did it come from? This is Gary Butler, or as he's known on the internet, the roaming cook. When Daria and I moved to Thailand, we relied on his YouTube videos as a guide to some of the coolest parts of Bangkok. And while his channel covers dishes from around the world, he lives here in the city and loves tracking down old and obscure stuff. Do you want to do this? Uh, please go ahead. I, I did this morning. We, 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 oh. that's, that's why I bought a whole bag of these to go. I'll, I'll, I'll pick you up. Yeah. Yeah, I want to make it clear while Jasper's filming from that angle that I'm not just. Yeah, yeah. This is a double fisting coffee. This was Daria's <laughs> cup that, that she's finished, and I, this is yours, right? Yeah. So, okay. No, no, so. no. I'm not. I'm not. You've now seen me on camera with I think four cups of coffee today, but only <laughs> yeah. two of them were, were mine. I'm so boring. He needs to keep drinking caffeine. <laughs> he's going to fall asleep. For me, it was like my first week ever, probably my first night ever in China after leaving Central Virginia, where I tried uh, my first Sichuan meal in a Sichuan yeah, restaurant. Yeah, yeah. And it was like the level of heat and spice and flavor was something that like my normal breakfast cereal and peanut butter and jelly had never <laughs> scratched that itch before. Uh, was there something, because I mean, you are also like, one of the things that's been a lot of fun about watching your channel is like, Big flavors. You're, you're, you, you, yeah. you don't like tone it down. No, no, no. And yeah, like I'm you're like... watching, just walking to the market. You're like, can I get an extra uh, chili, chili extra, pepper on yeah, this? Yeah. Was there something that for you was sort of woke up the palate where you're like, this is yeah, really. Yeah, do you know do you know what? I like to quote Anthony Bourdain. I'm paraphrasing, but he said something along the lines of when he moved from, when well, the first time he got to Asia, it was like he'd been living his life in black and white and it, so it suddenly he's in color. And that moment for me, um, we spoke off, off camera and I was saying the first place I went was Chiang Mai. And uh, I always tell people the first thing I eat was cow soy, but it wasn't actually, it was say oa, the, the, the Chiang Mai sausage, right? I always describe a say oa as tasting of Thailand, like what you would think, lime leaves, lemongrass, galangal, uh, garlic, some of them have ginger and chilies, like everything you associate with Thailand in one sausage. But being British, sausage is such a staple for us, right? That was the first the first bite I had. I didn't know I wasn't I didn't know what I was gonna be eating, but the shape of it, the the look of it looked like an English sausage, English breakfast sausage, but it just woke me up and like the explosion of flavour. It's a hard so tell, tell me what's on the table. Alright, so we've got Geng Te Po, which is one of my favourite curries, okay? Then we've got green curry, and it's interesting the fact this translates to sweet green curry, and it's not one of the sweeter curries, like there, there are sweeter curries and Red curry, geng ped, means hot curry, but this is actually spicier because it's using green, fresh 
chili. It's a classic Kalkamu flavors, right? You've got the star anise, uh, the cinnamon, and then you've got that extra layer that's like the fat and the collagen that's broken down from the from the from the skin pork leg and the skin, right? And the whole mock, which is a I, I, I would call it a mousse. It's a fish curry mousse. Fish curry steamed in a banana leaf. So this is a uh, lon tao tiao. Tao tiao is yellow bean. Okay. Prawn They're... meat and, and, and minced pork. So lon, if you have lon, it means it's, it usually means it's something fermented and it's been cooked. Yep. It's a light relish, as opposed to like a heavy relish that you get with a nampi. Once again, just like with the soup noodles, we found at this market a classic everyday Thai dish. In this case, green curry. But again, what makes it so special is not the dish itself, but rather the old fashioned, no shortcuts method of preparation. All right, so I know, I know there's more, but I know two main places that make their own curry paste, yeah? So they make their own curry paste here. They make their own curry paste in uh, Chek Pui, which is like, uh, the famous one from the Netflix famous special one, in right? China. Now that is spicier. That is a spicy green curry, yeah. But if you don't make your own paste, yeah, then there's nothing wrong with not making your own paste. Yeah? No one makes their own paste. Mm -hmm. You just go and see Auntie in the in the market that's been making it for 60 years and go get the paste from her, yeah. But say you want it, you want more, for argument's sake, more garlic, yeah. Some people instead of adding more garlic, they're just going to put more paste in, which is going to make it spicy. You can't. You can't sweep the flavour because you're not making the paste yourself. You can only put less or more in, right? So, I guess when they're making their own paste like this, they can sort of highlight what they want to highlight a little bit easier. Does that make sense? Now, before we reset the time machine to the present day and left Nanglung Market, if we really wanted to put ourselves in the headspace of actually being back in time, we'd need to take a moment to go beyond the food and really start to understand where we were. And anyway, we'd eaten plenty and needed a quick break, so if you'll indulge me for just a very brief respite, let's go back to Bangkok in 1900, on the first day this market opened. This would have been a pretty epic time to be in the Siamese capital. The city was prospering, the home to about half a million people with booming trade and culture. The king was the beloved Chula Longcorn, or Rama V, 32 years into his reign, and confident enough in his rule that for the first time, dissent and free speech were permitted and writers and thinkers flourished. Now, when it comes to everyday life here at that point in history, one of the biggest changes was the city outgrowing the canals. Until the 1890s, the waterways had been at the center of Bangkok living. But a new boom in road and inland construction brought structures like this. But even as the canals faded in importance, their impact was felt in neighborhoods like this one because of the waves of workers who'd come from China a generation earlier to aid in their construction or trade on the water. Actually, Bangkok has always been a city of immigrants. This specific neighborhood dates back to the 1780s, right around the start of the modern empire, when it was a Khmer settlement of Cambodian migrants. In fact, the name Nang Lung comes from a Khmer word meaning big pot. Because back then, this was where you'd go to buy Cambodian-made ceramic pots. Then the Vietnamese joined the Khmers here, and in the 1880s when a drought in China led to waves of people moving south, this area became a hub of Bangkok's southern Chinese community. Though here it was mainly Hakka and Fujianese with the Teochew from Chaozhou, more famously associated with Yarrawat, Bangkok's Chinatown, just a couple kilometers to the south. There's a reason we talk about Rama V so often on this channel. In Thailand, eras are measured by kings, and the two ages with the biggest impact on Thai food were the years of Rama II, when imperial dishes flourished and filtered out to the public, and Rama V, when Thais and immigrants came together in a booming Bangkok and built a city that combined the flavors and ingredients of the region into one giant melting pot just in time for the construction of the modern metropolis, beginning with places like this, right here at Nang Lung Market. Now, I've heard so much about this from this market, 
I, I don't know that I've had this before. It's the the sausage with rice. That that's a powdered rice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, it's supposedly a really old school dish that's super hard to find, and they have it here. So I don't know if you know anything about I've, this. I've, I've, I don't eaten know this any, before, I've never right? eaten this before either. Um, and it's not always. It's one of the things when you read about this market, especially in in Thai food blogs, it says if she's here, get it, get it. All right, now, Gary Butler is about as much of an authority on Thai market food as anyone alive, so it was quite a shock to find something here that was so rare that neither of us had ever tried it before. But that's for good reason. Sai Krok Planem, the sausage dish here, at, at one time was a local Bangkok specialty, but now, if it wasn't for this one vendor, it might be all but extinct. This stall has been selling this dish from this family at this market since the days the market first opened. And lucky for us, they're still there. So we've got snakehead fish, uh, pork skin, dried toasted, to sorry, toasted rice. And the Alaina? So peanut. Pickled garlic and chilies. It's the same stuff inside. It's got peanuts inside. The and it looks like rice inside? Peanut, pork, toasted rice, it's the same stuff in it. Toasted rice and pork skin. It's kind of sweet and peanutty. It's like a, it's gonna sound really ridiculous. It tastes like a, sort of like a Snickers sausage. <laughs> that is selling it actually pretty well. The taste of the sausage is almost like a sausage peanut butter sandwich. Yeah, 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 right. sausage peanut butter sandwich. That's a perfect, uh, perfect uh, analogy there. We'd arrived at Nang Long around nine in the morning just as the market was opening. By the end of the lunch hour, it was already starting to shut down. The thing about foods made in the old traditional way is you can't really scale it up, and once it's sold out, it's sold out. And this market is really only roaring for about two hours every day. But as we were leaving, we had to make room for one last meal. One of the oldest dishes actually served here and another relic from the days when the market first opened. It's beef soup in an endlessly boiling stock that's probably older than I am. So a perfect way for us to finish at this market is something that knocks off both of our goals for being here, which is number one, what food would have been served around the turn of the uh, uh, 19th to 20th century in, in Bangkok. And the other is, um, is uh, uh, the Chaozhou, Southern Chinese influence here. This is just beef. Gary was, was talking us through all the different cuts and parts, uh, but it's all in here. We have tendon, we have brisket, we have tripe, uh, we have liver, we have intestine, we have a homemade beef meatball, and we have some lean meat, uh, all in a broth of Chinese herbs that has been cooked since way before we got here this morning. So uh, again, we were out, <laughs> this is the first place, we, we parked right outside, came in here, walked past this two and a half hours before they opened for the day and they were already cooking everything down, the place smelled incredible. And, and we were like, um, like the puppy dogs at the dinner table just sitting outside asking, can you serve us the place? It's not ready yet. I've talked enough, I wanna taste it. So what we see again, I mentioned the different cuts of meats. Obviously we have this amazing broth, which is super aromatic. And then we have what appears to be chopped cilantro, and that might be sawtooth coriander actually in here. Oh yeah. And it's so savory. There's no artificial sweetness. That's just pure flavor development from cooking down the meat for so long. Now, just because this market here is one of a kind doesn't mean it's unique on the planet. All across the world, there are still places where old dishes and older techniques can still be found. Relics of a different time when there were no shortcuts and nothing was easy, but the rewards were incredible. But just because these places do exist doesn't mean they'll be here forever. This can't be taken for granted, and I learned that the hard way in my 12 years in Asia, where time after time I've seen ancient markets and old food streets just one day 
disappear. As amazing as our visit to Nanglung was, we were some of the youngest people there. Nearly everyone else, vendors and customers, were from an older generation, and ultimately this place will only survive as long as the business dictates. When there are no more buyers, the sellers disappear. Take it from a guy in the restaurant industry who's had my own places succeed and fail. If there are customers, we stay open. If not, we don't. History isn't enough to pay the bills. So do what you can to find these places and keep these dishes from going extinct. At least, until someone finally comes up with that time machine. So with all that said, here are the dishes that we found today. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Thank you so much to everyone for supporting us on Patreon. It helps to keep us going. For social media and the website, click the links below. And so like the cool thing about this market to me is the Hakka stuff, which is, yeah. which is not the same thing that you'd even see like in Yarrawat in Chinatown. That's yeah, very yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. closer to the Singaporean mm -hmm. sort of Southern Chinese. Right, right, you know? right. This is why I like your channel. <laughs> Thank there's you. No one else, there's no one else dropping this kind of knowledge on do you a YouTube know how channel. Many, do you know how many things like that that I'll say when we're filming and then when we go back to edit, I'll oh, realize, oh no, I was completely wrong and we yeah, have to edit it out. Like, ah, I, was, I, thought, I thought I had, that was such a great sounding yeah, yeah, point yeah, yeah, yeah. that we have to cut because I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm... You don't make a single mistake either. There's no uhs, there's no ums, it's just a perfect monologue and then you're like, oh, that wasn't true.